you too. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Anybody home? Oh, huh? Think, McFly. Right. Think. What's that supposed to mean? Hello? Hey. Hello? Anybody home? Huh? Think, McFly. Think. Until Monday. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Anybody home? Oh, hey! Right. Think, McFly. <laughs> think. Oh, McFly, your shoes are tied. Oh, oh, oh. ah. Don't be so gullible, McFly. Okay. I don't want to see you in here okay. again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. <laughs> Sure. Um, I am an osteopathic medical doctor. And for those that don't know what a DO is, a DO is like being an MD and a chiropractor. So we learn everything that we do as an MD. And then you also use, learn um, biomechanical medicine like a chiropractor. So a DO, in my opinion, is kind of like the best of both worlds. My first career, I was the director of an emergency department, a level two trauma center for 12 years in Finley, Ohio. I moved to Cleveland in 1996 to open an integrated health center, um, which I'm always proud to say we've had people from all 50 states and about 18 foreign countries to come to our clinic and get well and get off their pharmaceutical drugs. We have 13 employees. We Even in the shutdown, thank God, we're still open for business and we're still seeing patients. And so I've been doing that since 1996. Um, I went to a conference in the National Vaccine Information Center meeting in Washington, D.C. in September of 2000. And I learned that there were problems associated with vaccines, which I had never really investigated before. When I came home from that meeting, I said, I should probably look into this. Maybe I should start with the CDC documents. Maybe I'll start with the mainstream medical journals and see what I can find. Well, that led, has led me on an, a, a nearly 20 year odyssey and more than 40,000 hours worth of research into problems associated with vaccines. So I kind of, as I, I really kind of tout myself as one of the internationally known experts on problems with vaccines. I've written two books. I've written innumerable articles, blog posts. I've spoken at conferences all over the world and done literally hundreds, maybe hundreds of hundreds of radio interviews, podcast interviews, television interviews, trying to sow the seeds to let people know that vaccination is not a religion. You can't say, I believe in vaccines, and to let them people know that the, um, the vaccines are not safe, they've never been proven to protect you from getting sick, and they definitely can cause harm. So within six months, I had created two courses. One was for parents and one was for physicians. It was really more naturopaths, chiropractors, and, and acupuncturists, really not the mainstream medical people. And I spent, uh, there was a supplement company in, in California that hired me to teach all of the people who were their customer base. And for two years, every other weekend, I was on the road somewhere speaking at a seminar, talking to holistic practitioners, chiropractors, chiropractors naturopaths, acupuncturists, um, nurse practitioners, the rare and occasional MD or DO on problems associated with vaccines. So I've been doing this for, like I said, almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in September. Let me ask you this. I don't. I didn't get a chance to run this by you before we went live. I it just recently came to my attention, and I'm I'm going to guess many people don't know this. The CDC is a privately owned for profit company. I did they not are. know that. And they have a foundation too. They have a they have a five hundred one c three foundation. They have a five hundred one c four lobbying arm. And in their five hundred one c three foundation, almost every major corporation that you can think of, whether it's in the healthcare, manufacturing, biomedical um, division or not, almost everybody is a member of their foundation. So they can shuffle money into them and get a tax deduction and shuffle it out in terms of grants on the other side. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. I saw this and they're like, if a patient is in the hospital with any type of comorbidity, whether it's heart problems, they've had lung conditions, they have COPD, they have asthma, they've had a perforated bowel, they had some sort of sepsis, and they die. If you suspect that maybe, just suspect, you don't have to test them, you don't have to swab them, you don't have to confirm it, but that perhaps they had been infected with the, with the SARS-CoV virus, then you put down on the death certificate as one of the co-causes the co of death as is is a is a coast is the virus is SARS CoV or, or COVID nineteen, so they're stacking the deck to make it look like there's more and more people dying from this in, from this infection than what really is. Then every diagnosis, every diagnosis from like you said, a broken arm to a heart attack to a headache, um, there there's a diagnosis code that goes along with that. Well, the COVID nineteen came out with a, a diagnosis code, and I believe there's there's a couple of different ones that you can use that they use modifiers with it. But the idea is is that that's a number that goes on a death certificate that goes into a database that then they can scan through the database and say oh wow look out of 100 people that died 90 of them died from COVID-19. Vaxter is same playbook different virus 
And I did it through a historical lens. And I talked about SARS in 2002, bird flu in 2005, swine flu in 2009. And now we're doing the same thing with COVID-19. And why have we taken the entire global economy to its knees over what's gonna be a big fat nothing burger? And I said, those people at the very top of our, of our food chain who are pulling and yanking on our strings here are probably sitting back on their desk, putting their feet up on their desk, smoking their big fat Smokies, laughing their butts off saying, it only took three weeks to take 7.2 billion, billion people, turn them into sheep, make them wear gloves and hats and be scared to death and absolutely be frightened to literally to death over a flu virus. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. And I knew that this was like, you know, everybody was saying, look to the right, look to the right, look to the right. When the real action was happening, look to the left. And this was an economic warfare and for some reason, somebody out there decided they were going to take our economy and the global economy to their knees. And the social distancing, the other thing, as soon as they started saying it, I started saying to all my friends and colleagues, I said, do you understand what a PSYOP that is? I mean, social distancing. If they didn't say physical distancing or adequate far, far away that we've tested that you need to have physical distancing, be careful about washing your hands, social distancing, which is the disruption of the human genome in terms of how, not genome, but uh, human collab, uh, uh, collective, because right. humans are, Humans are social animals. We're a social breed. We like to hug. We like to kiss. We like to high five. We like to shake hands. We like to do all of those things. And now they have disrupted that. They've disrupted our churches. They've disrupted, you know, we can't go to our kids' basketball games. Now everybody's stuck in their house. It's, um, it's a complete psychological psyop on the world, quite frankly. Right. And so th this whole thing about the death rate that they report every day, the death rate is absolutely irrelevant unless you know the, new, know the denominator. So if you have 100 people that die, and the denominator is 100 out of 1,000, that's a legitimate 10% death rate, and that's pretty concerning. But if you have 100 people die, and the denominator is a million, it's 0 .00 something. It's irrelevant. Let more people die on a weekend in car accidents or in gunfights in South Chicago or from drug overdoses than that. And so th them just saying every day, reporting the death rate, the death rate, the death rate is, a, it, again, it's a psychological operation to have people be fearful to, and to put into their subconscious the demand to be vaccinated. They want, to be, they want them demanding a vaccine. They want to have people lining up the very next day as soon as it's available. And people have no idea what's going to come through that needle. They, have, they, don't, understand, they, don't, oof, they don't understand that, that the uh, vaccine industry has 100% complete and total liability protection from anything that comes through that needle through the PrEP Act. And they are, they're begging to be inoculated with something that could kill them. And as far as this testing goes, and for you to get your little piece of paper that says, hey, I'm clean, I don't have the virus, then people, then what is the next step, people? The next step is for them to say, oh, you don't want to lose your little certificate here, or you don't want to get to the airport and have left it at home. Why don't we put it on that little microchip so that you've always got it with you? It's always going to be in your hand, and you don't want to touch any of that dirty money. That might be spreading those that bad COVID virus stuff. So that will put all of your money in that little chip that'll be in your hand too, and you'll never have to worry again. It'll all be right there. It's <laughs> create a virus, create a vaccine, make bill you know, with humans. People are, people, I just want people to really understand this is an absolute pandemic. It was absolutely planned to get people to demand to be vaccinated. It came out of the 2015 adult vaccination plan. Goal number three in that plan is clearly stated. Uh, people need to increase the demand for vaccines and the demand, and demand to be vaccinated. The demand to be vaccinated. 